Yes, and we're finally at the model training section of this notebook. So let's quickly go into it and see what we're going to do here. Uh, first, again, I copy the original notebook, uh, original data frame that I have to a new data frame. And then I choose the input and the target features separately. I want to note them here. So again, the categorical ones that we have is the ones that we already had before. And then I created some new ones like weekday, weekend is holiday and borrow. Uh, and we also created some new numerical features, which are temperature, humidity, and some other weather uh, related features. And I put them in input features. Uh, this time we don't include trip distance because we know why now <laughs> that causes leakage. Uh, and then we have our target feature, which is the total amount. So after I run this, I again split the data set into train and test. And the first one that I want to do is decision tree because we already used the decision tree in our uh, benchmark model. And I want to try it in the same settings and see if we achieved any um, increase in the performance and see if this actually made sense to do all those work. Well, actually it did. So our performance was our R2 score, R squared score was uh, 0.22. And now what we have is 0.3. So it's actually a pretty good increase. Our model is able to explain the variation in the data much better with the new features. And we also have a little bit of a decrease of the errors. So that is great. So let's see also how it looks in a plot. Okay, so that's nice. So if you remember, I mentioned that I am going to use max depth as 10 here. And I was going to explain to you why. And now I'm going to explain to you why. So uh, let's go ahead and find the scikit-learn library um, decision tree information. This is how you can find it. And this is not this one, decision tree regressor is what I'm looking for. So I want to see the documentation of what we can use. So as you can see here, there are a lot of parameters or so hyperparameters. Uh, you know, the criterion, the function to measure the quality of a split, a splitter, max depth, min sample split, etc., etc., etc. So, when you are training a model, of course, you should go through these and understand what your options are. Um, but, you know, as I told you, if you don't put anything here, it will basically have a default value for all these parameters. So, you know, for example, max depth will be none. So, that will mean that the tree will go as deep as it will uh, possibly can. There will be no limitations for it. But let me show you what happens when I do that. So all of a sudden, even though our tree is bigger, our performance is way lower. It's, it's very, very bad. And this is what we call an overfit, actually. So why this happens is that uh, decision trees have a tendency to overfit. So what happens here is that the, the model itself has a very good performance on the training data. So it's able to understand the training data very well and it fits every single data point in the training set very well, but then it loses the ability to generalize. So when you give it a totally new data point that it has never seen before, it is not able to give it a good value or it is not able to predict it in a good way. So what happens is you get a very low score for your test set and very high scores for your training data set. So let me show you that here in an example. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give max depth different values. So I'm going to give it 2, 5, 8, 10, 15, etc., etc., and 150. If it was, if we also included none, it will be also after 150 because you know it's like as deep as it might go. It could be 500, 1,000. You know, basically it goes as deep as it can. Uh, it the the settings allow it to. So let's see this. This will take a second. Okay, so all of them have fitted now. Now I'm going to show you a plot. So this plot shows me for all the max depth that I tried, which is from two to 150, uh, root mean squared errors. So higher for this is worse and lower is better. So, you know, of course you wanna achieve zero error. And these two lines here, 
the blue one is my error for the training set. So the error that I made on the training set and the orange one is the error I made on the test set. So as you can see, what happens here is that as you go higher a little bit from two to five to eight and 10 and probably a little bit to 15, both my training error and my testing error are getting lower. But after a while, the training error keeps getting lower, but because it's overfitting from this point on, my test error starts getting higher because the, the model loses its ability to generalize and take a good guess on, guess on new um, data points that it's seeing outside of the training set. So that's what happens here. And that's the reason basically that I used max depth as 10 here because I didn't want the first model that we trained to be um, an overfitted one. So that's why we're able to see a good um, score here. And um, as we can see, also 10 is basically the best one. We can see here, um, we can also see these values. If I, um, this is the one where I kept them. Oh, let me just quickly write a data frame. Make it a data frame so we can see it nicer. Um, yeah. So yeah, as you can see here is the point where the test uh, or this one is the point where the test error, no, even this one, <laughs> 10 is the point where the um, testing error starts getting worse. So it first gets lower and then it starts getting higher. So 10 is basically the best value that we have. And the reason that it overfits this fast is because decision trees have a tendency to overfit. And that's why we will be using other um, algorithms to see how we can, you know, if we can get a better um, score. So yeah, let's remember that the best score that we're getting and our, our squared score we're getting from decision trees is 0.3. Another problem that might happen is underfitting. Underfitting is basically the opposite of overfitting. So it's basically when your model is not complex enough to understand the data and to fit the data's pattern. And it just cannot explain the data even in the training set. So just to briefly show you an example, I prepared this here. Let's say my max depth was one. Then what happens is this is my training um, uh, score. My, this is my training score. So what happens is uh, this is my training score and my R squared score would be 0.1 for the training set. So even for in the training uh, data set, it, it's not able to explain the data so well, it fit it so well. And also for the test set, I'm not really getting a great uh, R2, um, R squared score. <laughs> Keep saying R2, it's R squared. Okay, uh, so yeah, this is what we have for now. And uh, after this one, I'm going to show you a random forest and a gradient boosting algorithm, a gradient booster alg algorithm. And we're gonna compare the results of these to our decision tree. Uh, but first I wanna tell you, how do I choose these algorithms, you know, based on what am I deciding which algorithm to use? So there's actually a really nice trick here. Um, if you just search for machine learning cheat sheet, just on Google, you know, you have a couple of options, but I always keep going back to this one. So it's basically like a little chart that shows you how you should choose an algorithm. So, you know, what, what is your problem? That's what you should uh, think about first. Is it a dimensionality reduction? Uh, yes or no? Then th for this one, no, this is not a dimension dimensionality reduction problem. Uh, do we have responses? Yes. So we, we have the target value. So this is a supervised uh, learning problem and not an unsupervised learning problem. We are predicting numeric. So yes. So basically it's saying, okay, we're doing supervised learning regression. We knew this already, but you know, just uh, summarize it. And uh, basically it says, if you want accuracy, you choose one of these ones. If you want speed, you choose one of these ones. So uh, I wanted to try both. So basically that's why I, I mean, it's also decision trees is always the first thing that I go with more or less. Uh, that's why I tried decision tree. And I also want to try random forest and gradient boosting tree. So now that I shared that with you, 
I can go back and tell you what we're doing here. Uh, it's again the same thing, you know. I said I'm not going to use any of the parameters just yet. I just want to, I just want to see how it's going to perform in its default mode, and then by doing tuning, we're, I mean we're going to choose one of these algorithms to do the tuning on, and by doing the tuning, we will find the best parameters. But I don't want to waste time on that just yet. So let's uh, fit our random forest. Okay, so the random forest model is ready. So let's see how it performed. Yes, so it actually looks pretty good because we have a R squared score of 0.38. And if you remember, the best decision tree that we had had around like 0.30. So even without tuning, even with the only default model, we are getting some good scores from random forest. So I, uh, I am believing in it. <laughs> I believe that it's going to be a good model, but let's see. So, um, I also want to plot our prediction. So it is going in the right direction. Again, as I said, the, if it's a straight line, it means perfect, but we're not going for perfect. We're going for good enough. So it looks like it is going in the right direction. So the next model that I want to try is gradient boosting. Again, I'm not really using any uh, parameters here just yet. I'm just using a default version of the model just to, you know, compare them to each other. So the gradient boosting algorithm is also ready. So just quickly see how it performed. Okay. So we have a R squared score of 0.36, which is pretty good, but in a second we will compare all of the algorithms together. So we'll take a closer look there. I also want to see how the predictions look. Okay. Again, as I said, you know, this is a, the perfect line and we're kind of getting close to it, you know? And yeah, I, I think, I think we have a really good chance here. So one other thing that I want to tell you about tree based algorithms is that they are highly explainable and we are able to see which feature works the most and towards predicting the target value. So, I can show you here, for example, apparently this specific algorithm apparently used the borrow information the most, specifically the Manhattan information. So that's good for us to know, you know, if you want to change your features or which one you include, which one you don't include, I think this is very good information for you to see. You can also, you know, if you expect a certain feature to work the best, but then you don't even see it here. Maybe you made a mistake about it and then you'll realize it here and you can go change it. So that's pretty useful. So let's see here. We have uh, all the um, uh, models listed here with their performances. This is the mean absolute error. This is the root mean squared error. And this is the R2 score, R, R squared score. So as you can see, the best one is the random forest one. Um, the gradient boosting is very close. It's, it's very, they're very similar. You can't really say random forest is much better than gradient boosting, especially not before you do tuning or cross validation, which we'll talk about in the next, um, module. So, um, just because I like random forest, I'm going to go with random forest in the specific one, and I will be tuning the random forest in the next uh, module in a tuning section in the tuning section. So if you uh, also want to go ahead and try tuning it, that would be great. Um, you don't have to do random forest. If you want, you can also go with a gradient boosting. You can also try and tune decision tree to see what kind of uh, uh, performance that you get, what kind of uh, error or R square score you get. So um, yeah, and I'll, I'll show you what I did in the next video.